Hi, I'm Tobias Carlyle. This is the Aquarius Podcast. My special guest today is David Horn. He's the adjunct professor of applied value investing at Columbia Business School. We're going to talk valuation methodology, starting and shuttering a hedge fund and lots of other issues like Tesla and so on right after this. Tobias Carlyle is the founder and principal of Aquarius Funds. For regulatory reasons, he will not discuss any of the Aquarius Funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Acquires Funds or affiliates. For more information, visit AcquiresFunds.com. You graduated from Tulane. Correct, 96, Tulane, yep. 96, and then you start as uh, as an analyst at Sanford Bernstein, 96 to 2000. That's when the, the dot-com boom 1.0 is absolutely roaring. Uh, what was that like being in a value shop? Yeah, I started at Bernstein. Um, I was it's called an a, a portfolio, associate portfolio manager, and it's, you know, it's it's an entry level job. Look, it's you're you're 22 years old, and like they don't actually give you, um, they don't let you analyze things, right? Or, or make, <laughs> but um, but imagine, you know, if you have um, any separately managed accounts, imagine if you had, you know, 2,000 of them, and instead of at that time, instead of automating the whole thing, you wanted someone to make sure. Things were in balance. Things were, um, if you had, uh, we had a lot of pension funds that maybe didn't want tobacco stocks. And back then, Bernstein was big in tobacco stocks. And so you had to make sure that things were in balance, that they were selling the things they were supposed to do. That the, basically, that the black box was working properly. And so I would oversee that. But what was cool about it was, you know, I got to, um, I got to sit in uh, with, you know, the director of research every morning, right? And so I'm 22. I don't really know what I'm doing. Um, and being able to hear those people analyze and talk about the world around us. I mean, that was from 96 to 99. So I'm at this famous value shop and the internet bubble's going on. But, you know, they, they got screamed at and yelled at for being idiots, dinosaurs. You know, I mean, they've been managing money for 40 years, right? And it was like, it was very eye-opening to me that, you know, when you read about, oh, you know, value, it's contrarian, and, 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 but there's a reward. And it's, and man, it's brutal, right? And you have redemptions and you get called names. And these are adults. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's very hard to sort of stick to, um, you know, stick to your guns. And for them, it worked out. Um, although they did sell to Alliance right before the whole thing came crashing uh, down. So, so, you know, I don't know if they decided, I wasn't privy to the conversations, but I don't know if they decided, look, we need to be part of a larger shop if it would have happened anyways. But, but sort of right after that, you know, they looked, they, they nailed it. They were dead on. And then they had some great performance. Yeah, you know, I didn't really know value. I didn't know growth. Um, I remember being in a, in a, in a class uh, my senior year of college and, you know, there was a stock picking class um, or one of the activities was stock picking contest. And, you know, someone picked Netscape. And of course that, you know, they, they won the contest. Um, and well, I can't stand stock picking contests because of what it reinforces. It was just sort of funny that it's like, like six that, weeks or something, right? <laughs> Who picks the right? Exactly. It's like, it's, it's literally the worst thing you could, you know, it's like, it's funny, you're a value investor, but if you had your, your kid in a, in a stock picking contest and it was, you know, eight weeks long, you're yeah. like, I don't know what has the most momentum and yeah. like, can we lever it? Yeah. Right? Let's get the options. Um, Let's get the OTM exactly, calls. Exactly. I want to buy yeah, YOLO calls, you know, 50% out of the money that inspire, expire in six weeks. Um, so I, I go to Bernstein and, you know, this is sort of right as, as the tech bubble's happening. Um, and it's funny because I think Bernanke actually, uh, not Bernanke, Greenspan, Greenspan. said just this irrational exuberance. That was late 97. And I think that sometimes get it sometimes gets lost in sort of how long that, that bubble really was, um, how hard it was to time. But, you know, so I'm sitting there in this value shop and they're doing good work. I remember they, um, they found these, they, they were, you know, the bonds were, had, a, had a decent yield and, um, they're buying paper stocks, they're buying tobacco stocks, you know, sort of performance is fine, but everywhere else, you know, everyone's jumping into tech. Um, and, and I learned an important lesson, which is essentially, if your benchmark is the S&P 500, and you're not in a big portion of the S&P 500, if you're underweight or severely underweight, you're effectively short. Because right. what you're doing is you're rooting for, if that goes up, you look bad. And if that goes down, you look good. You don't have, you don't actually hold it. You don't lose capital. And there's this famous saying that you know you can't eat relative performance. But I think that's actually nonsense because you that you kind of do eat relative performance because you need to raise capital and you need to hold capital. And if you outperform, um, you know you you raise more capital. And so um, relative performance does matter. And it's sadly it's 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 a big game we're playing. Um, and so. 
Yeah, you know, and as I was there for more and more years and, and the bubble got crazier and crazier, I mean, basically we would, we were getting fired. Um, and, you know, I was there and it was very, it was very sharp research. These, these, these analysts were really at the top of their game and, you know, were being, pension funds were just upset that they were missing out on private clients. And it's hard, you know, you go to the golf course and, and you know, you're, you're talking with your friends and they're buying whatever, you know, tech stock du jour or IPO du jour. And you say, you know, well, we bought more, you know, international paper, right? <laughs> Nobody wants to hear that. And, um, and, and eventually, you know, they were right and they nailed it. And, and that was sort of my first introduction to cycles, um, sticking to your guns, uh, being a contrarian, uh, how much, you know, uh, Grantham talks about sort of going into a, a big uh, group of analysts and sort of asking them if any of them think this can sustain itself and sort of none of them did, but no one does anything about it, right? Because of all the career risk. And I think when you read the books and you hear about investing, you don't learn about any of that stuff. And that was sort of my first hand view of it. Um, you, you have to, you have to get to the end to, um, you know, es essentially be right. When you, yeah, when you say you don't learn about it, you don't learn about how hard it is to uh, have that the weaker performance with everybody making money really easily outside. No, you you don't, and and, and it's an interesting thing because people talk about benchmarks. You know, what's your benchmark? S and P. You know, mine's the Russell. It's like your benchmark is whatever else people can do with their capital. And so, if your cousin is on Robinhood and crushing it at Thanksgiving, um, you know, they might say, "Well, can you manage my money instead of Toby?" And you're like, but, 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 "Look at what he's doing." He's, you know, you don't want to speak badly about your cousin, but the point is that, um, you know, they don't, it, it's not, they're all, their alternative isn't just, oh, I can put it in an index fund. And so, you know, that makes things very hard and in a bubble. Um, and we see it time and time again, where it is, um, uh, it's very tough emotionally. And, you know, even Druckenmiller talks about it, that he basically, he knew better in 2000, right? And he did it anyway. So if Druckenmiller does it, what's our hope, right? Um, I love the story that Druck. Druck kind of knew that he couldn't do it himself, so he got two young guys in there to really rip up the, uh, blow the portfolio up. Yeah, he did that, and I, I guess well, whatever it was, he, um, you know, he jumped in sort of in March, right? He threw like six billion in, and they said to him, "What did you learn?" He said, "I didn't learn anything." <laughs> I, I knew not to do it already. <laughs> I, I know we all know this, right? But it's and you think about your business, right? Not I put up a Twitter poll the other day, which sort of said, um, you know, what what's your confidence level that that you can outperform over three years if you manage other people's money. I don't know if you saw that one, but you know, about half the people said it's 50%, and 10% of the people said 90%. I wanted to say to them, you're either amazing managers you're in tech. or wildly <laughs> overconfident. And I think it's the latter, and I don't want to pick on anybody, but you know, thank you for answering my poll. But let's go back to the 50% of the people, and you sort of sit there and you say, look, it's a coin flip. I, ju I just don't know. But you've also structured a business that that's really bad. So let's go to let's go to year three and you've underperformed three years and you say, OK, well, how many years, realistically speaking, can I ask for someone's capital? You know, you can't. It's not it's not a decade. That's not a fair ask. Right. I'll be right. Uh, you know, every decade. And so but you need more than three years. Right. And so but how does your behavior change in year four? Right. And and, you know, OK, second half of year four, you're like, all right, I'm just going to just a little bit of momentum, I'm gonna tweak it a little bit. Right. I'm not going to go. I'm not, I went from deep value to some value. OK, well, compounders and oh i'll buy apple at 30 times earnings right and it's still kind of value but the point is how you performed changes how you behave and and you can see how people you know and then it gets to the point where you're behind and you know do you have to gun it to basically try to catch up to retain the capital to make it to the next cycle and again bernstein was my first sort of entree into that so you you uh you didn't really have much of a, an idea about growth or value before you went in, but then you go to the crucible of value to do your MBA, you go to Columbia. So you must have had some idea that value was where you wanted to go at the end of being at Stanford. Yes, that's exactly right. So, you know, I, I and I think being at Stanford Bernstein helped me get into Columbia because it certainly wasn't my grades as an undergrad. Um, <laughs> And so, I mean, I went to school at Tulane, so I think you should have huge grade inflation for simply surviving four years in New Orleans. <laughs> but um, so I, uh, you know, but I knew I needed to go back to school and I knew that I didn't have sort of the analytical chops. Um, so I, I was fortunate enough to attend Columbia and really had an amazing experience there and got more and more exposure to sort of value. And I had a, 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 an applied value investor, um, professor um, named Paul Sonkin. Yeah. Who ran you know, a, a micro cap and a nano cap fund. And he was p nice enough after I graduated, it was, it was Oh two and it was sort of right after September 11th and it wasn't the greatest economy. And so I was sort of looking 
for a position and he said, look, you know, I'm not going to pay you, but you can work with me. Um, and so I learned a ton by osmosis and it was really, um, was this hummingbird? Know, this is hummingbird. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I was, I was there for about, you know, nine or 12 months and I, I watched what he did and it was, it was fantastic. Um, again, exposure to a really smart analyst, how, how we talk to companies. And if you think about it, you know, all right, well, what, what questions do I ask a company? How do I, how do I interface with a company? He became, he was very much a suggestivist, um, you know, which is, you know, not quite activist and, and not, um, you know, no threats, but look, you know, you're a micro cap and I've been doing this and I can help you and you can say no to my help. But again, we have sort of aligned interests. So listen, and, and he had some success with that. Um, and then I ended up joining up with a, a long short fund called perennial, which, um, has morphed into an RIA, but, uh, you know, and, and so there I got some exposure to the short side. Um, and that was through, you know, I worked at perennial from 03 to 06. And that was through the housing bubble. And this is where I had a slightly different experience, where I actually covered some of the uh, subprime housing companies on the long side. And they were really cheap. And you know, you could look at New Century, and they had these huge dividend yields, right? And so, um, you know, there what happened was we made some good money, and then we started to lose money as things started sort of turn in 05. And then we, we, we fortunately we sold out of them. But you know, I remember coming back from a trip to California to visit New Century. And I was frustrated because I didn't get it. And I was having problems with the financial statements. And instead of saying that I, it was some naivety, like I wasn't like, oh, there's, you know, there's something weird here. I, I viewed it as, as a failure on my part. To analyze it um, properly. And, what's that? You, you, you viewed it as a failure to analyze it properly rather than something wrong with their financial statements. Exactly. Um, and, you know, look, it shouldn't be that hard. Right? I mean, businesses aren't that hard. If it is that hard, um, and look, you also, you might say like, ah, it's too hard, I don't wanna do this, but you have a boss that they say, you know, you should do this, and what happened? And so it was sort of a great experience there, and, and you know, I said to my boss, look, I, I, I don't wanna do these sorts of companies anymore, and we sort of had a talk, and he said, you know, why don't, why don't you do what I did? Why don't you go, go try to start something? Um, and he was one of my, you know, uh, one of my first investors, and I was, you know, about 30 at the time, and I, was really excited to sort of, um, you know, do this on my own. And what I realized through so much of, um, you know, looking at the, the institution of, of managing money was that, you know, you would have a conversation with someone and they would talk about how they were investing and they'd say, you would talk about a name and they'd say, well, maybe I'd put that in my PA. I really like it, but I can't put it in my fund. And I thought, well, why don't I run a fund like a PA? Like, why don't, if this is what I want to do with my capital, I think people want to be in the names where you want to put your capital, not what you know is is fits the box for for your fund. All right. Um, and so I started based on that premise, uh, and I started a fund in 06, and it's actually quite interesting because I did fine in 06 and 07, and I actually performed very well in the crisis. I had a long short book, the shorts worked, the hedges worked, um, and so. This gave me a great deal of buying power, uh, sort of in the depths of late 08 and early 09. And, you know, one of the things that really resonated with me at the time was that you, you would basically see things go bidless. You would see micro caps go bidless. And so at the time, Lending Tree, I think it had been a spinoff. It was relatively new um, to the market and at eight bucks in cash. And I was buying it for between 150 and three. You know, just sitting there on the bid. And I'm like, I don't, I, I hadn't mastered the business, but. They've got eight bucks in cash, you know, so and, and, and I'm so I'm buying that thing. And again, all of this happened was because um, I'll do a quick tangent. I, I hate it when people talk about a short book in a vacuum. How are your shorts doing? What shorts do is allow you to do other things on the long side. So in a sell off, they give you dry powder. But if, you know, you're 70 percent invested in 30 percent cash and I'm, you know, 60 uh, percent invested in 40 percent short, um, it can actually sort of if my I, I take that back if i if i'm you know 90 percent long and 30 percent short and my shorts are flat i actually have more capital at work on the long side than you do and so people say like well, why you know you lost two percent on your shorts you're always losing on your shorts why are you shorting i'm like yes but you have to hold them against what did i hedge what's the other side of the book i was able to take more exposure than you were because you only had cash as a hedge. And so it has to be viewed holistically. And that's frankly how the portfolio worked. It worked incredibly well. Oh nine, we come out of the trough and I'm doing great. And, but, but, but something didn't sit right with me, which was essentially that I didn't see the housing crisis coming. And I should have, because I was kind of front and center. 
And a lot of the party lines that, you know, that, that um, we've never had a drop in houses uh, nationwide, um, uh, you know, since the Great Depression. And so I believe that sort of thing. And what really frustrated me was that if you go back and you look at some of the things Grantham did at the time, you know, you have to, if you want to look at, okay, if, if, if prices are sort of moving along in a, in a relatively straight line, yes, they don't fall. But sure, they never fell nationwide, but they also didn't go up 2x nationwide in three years, right? You have to, you, you have to look at the action before. So, oh, it never went down 50%. Well, and, and those aren't the, the numbers, but the point is if you sort of look at the parabola, you have to look at the left side of it. And, 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 and it's sort of, of course they came down. And, and so while I thrived, I was frustrated because it caught me off guard. And you know you can um, get things wrong and, and, and make money, you can get things right and lose money. And this was an instance where portfolio construction helped me, but I, I was wrong. I didn't sense a crisis coming. Um, do, do, you think, and, do you think that they are predictable? Do you think that something like that is predictable? Well, so that brings me to my next step, which was I said, I missed this. Who am I not listening to? Who called this? And it wasn't just guys like Burry and people in the big short, but if you actually go back and you look at some of the cycles and you look at guys like Grantham, guys like Montier, guys like Hussman, you know, and they sort of, and then, and this is where I sort of got into the world of Q ratio, CAPE ratio, um, market cap to, to GDP. And you go back and you look at Buffett, you know, 99, he's talking about these things. And you look at that metric. And again, I didn't read him in 99, but I said, and then, you know, okay, well, what causes all this and sort of this low interest rates and sort of pushing everybody in Tina and trying to get everybody in, in, into stocks. And I said, wow, you know, these cycles are predictable, um, or at least the risk reward is. And this is what I got wrong, which was there was, it's very elegant. Um, and it worked very well two times. And the third time, it didn't. And that's this time. Yeah. So now, will it work? I suspect it will. But as far as me managing other people's capital under that premise, I didn't do it successfully. Um, I fought it. And, you know, my shorts were too big and my hedges were too big and my longs weren't in the right places. Um, and, you know, you try to learn and you try to do, do better and, and sort of, you know, you go back to the lab and look at what you did wrong. Um, and, and sort of that's and so but it didn't make sense for me to continue running other people's money and it wasn't doing well enough. Um, I couldn't I certainly couldn't raise more. And I, um, you know, I decided to give the capital back and also something that you know, I, was, I was frustrated. I was frustrated. And it's funny, you know, if you go back and look at, you know, Buffett in 68 and 69 or 70, he gave all the capital back. He talks about, well, I'm not finding opportunities. Now, that's Warren Buffett, right? He couldn't find opportunities. But or if you look at, at, at um, Julian Robertson in 99, essentially saying that I don't understand this market. And I don't think I realized that I didn't understand the market. And I wasn't Julian, certainly not Julian Robertson or Warren Buffett. But the point is that I, uh, what I was doing wasn't working. And I, when you're doing it every day, it's really hard to take a step back. And you know, he's like, you have a deep value. You're a deep value guy. And so um, you have a book about it, and you have, you know, you have a fund about it. And so I think the question would be, well, what if, what if you didn't want to be a deep value guy anymore? Or what if you wanted to tweak it? Um, and I needed. Again, I needed a reset. I needed to look at what I did wrong, and I needed to say. Um, and so here, here's here, here's another great metaphor. So, um, and we'll get to this. But but I, I teach value investing at Columbia to MBA students. In my first year, 2013, 2014, one of the things I would do in one of the first classes was I would hand out the IBD, you know, Investors Business Daily top 20 rules for investing. And some of the rules are: don't look at things like PEs. Uh, don't buy stocks under five dollars. It doesn't make any sense, right? You know, and, and so as a value investor, you laugh at this, right? And 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 so I would sort of say, you know, to the students, like, look, look, this is what's out there. This is what's on the other side of the trade. And then I went and looked, and William O'Neill compounded it like over 20%. So, you know, Buffett says about value investing, look, you either get it or you don't, right? And we're sort of all in this 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 club and we think we get it and other people don't. But it's not really true. And there are a lot of paths to heaven. Now, value investing still resonates with me, and we'll talk about some of the sort of the principles and the framework and the way I think about things. But I think there was a level of, um, I don't know, I don't even want to call it hubris, because I, I, it's not that I had a big head, but I guess it was not really being open to other ways of making money, and that the other side of the trade isn't, they might be doing something really smart too. Um, you know, again, O'Neill, he's using 
technicals. And by the way, fun fact, Buffett used technicals for six years. So, of course, it was Warren Buffett. Like, he used technicals. That sounds like a joke. He, I, he, he gave a speech years ago to a business school. I can send you the PDF. But the point is he experimented with them. He decided that they didn't work. Six years is a long time. But I didn't feel like I was in a position or had the bandwidth to experiment with anything. And if you think about the job of managing money and how many balls there are to juggle, and this is the other mistake I made, I went at it alone. And I think, you know, if you want to do all the things that it takes to, to, to manage capital, um, it's really, it's, it's hard and it's, it's a mistake to do it alone. Um, I joke, you know, the second most important decision after finding your spouse is really finding a partner to that has the same sort of vision you do and looks at the world the same way you do, because if you can start a business with them, um, you know, whether it be a sounding board, whether it be someone to take a call, or the, the ability to step away. And I think I was too deep in and I didn't have that ability. I think it's very important, um, you know, to be able to sit on the couch and think. And, uh, you know, I got a real, little too wrapped around the axle. And so, so I stopped. Do you, I mean, what, what year did you, what year did you finish up? 15. And the strategy was a micro cap value, is that fair? No, it was everything. It was long, short. So I had some, uh, I had micro cap, but, but I was really, you know, I went anywhere and did everything um, in equities for, for the most part. And how sort of concentrated, diversified were you? Um, I usually didn't have much bigger than, you know, six or 7% positions. I, I, my, my joke is that if you are looking at the, if, if you're looking at the ticker, it's too big. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, and again, it wasn't, it was sort of death by a thousand cuts. There wasn't one thing. I didn't have a valiant, you know, it wasn't, it, it wasn't, um, it, it, it was, you didn't blow things. up. I, you, I, you, I, it just I didn't small, I, just I, everything I, kind of didn't work. I bled out. Yeah. Yeah. I did not blow up. Um, and I mean, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but, but, uh, you know, and I think that's when you, you know, when you think about portfolio construction. And here's an interesting thing: I, I, I like to ask fund managers now. It's sort of like, what's the worst thing that could happen to your portfolio? Like, what world events? The worst thing that could happen? What are you not prepared for? And so, and here's the other thing that happened after the crisis. And, and you know, a lot of your listeners probably weren't there for it, but it was terrifying in the sense that Bernanke said, if we didn't do something, 12 of 13 banks would have collapsed. So basically, this the, the institutions would have collapsed. You know, you're raised on, you think that there's adults in the room and you find out that there aren't. And then you, they start doing all the same policies all over again. And you're like, uh, and you know, that, that whole sort of, I feel like I'm taking crazy pills, but you're watching, you know, low interest rates and literally the exact same behavior coming again. And then as a fiduciary, I'm looking at my investors and saying, oh my God, you know, they have house insurance, they have fire insurance, they have life insurance, they have zero portfolio insurance. Like if you mention portfolio insurance to people, it sounds sort of absurd. It sounds something that's too expensive with something that, you know, and again, all of those insurance, you write the check every year and you're not like, oh, damn, my house didn't burn down. I spent all that money on insurance, right? You're happy. Um, portfolio insurance, a short book. And I, I mentioned this to you earlier, but look, I only took a small portion of anyone's capital. And that's another thing that was important to me. Look, if you have 75% of my capital, Toby, I'm not going to leave you alone. Right. I'm going to ask you questions all the time. Why do we have this loser? What's going on here? Oh, you went away for a week. The market's down. You, you know, I'm going to bother you. I have a claim on your time. And it's reasonable to have a claim on your asset manager's time. But that time has to be if you spend two hours a day, you know, once a month with every client, you have, you know, 30 clients, you start to do that math and, and you're sort of doing a disservice to everybody else. But that money that I did have, I sort of took it upon myself and I probably shouldn't have. I took it upon myself and said, I want I want to create a hedge for these people. Um, so that when things do collapse, which they will, uh, they have uh, some protection and the portfolio will perform well, just as it did in the past cycle. And, you know, whether or not maybe they if they wanted that, maybe they would have gone to Spitznagel, right? Maybe they would have gone to a short only fund. Um, and so I sort of morphed in that sense. And again, you know, it didn't work. Um, and it didn't make sense. The economics, the economics of, of running capital um, you know, it has to work. That's how hedge funds work. And we can talk a little bit about that because I think, I think, I think incentives are a little bit misaligned with, with your sort of classical, well, with most, most, most uh, asset management, but hedge funds in particular. And I guess well, my point that I would make to that is I think if you were to match up lockups with um, incentive, so you come to me and you say, Dave, I love what you're doing. And I say, listen, let's say it's just one in 20. My 20 won't cash out 
until your lockup ends. So Toby, you give me 10 years of money and we'll settle up at the end of 10 years since whatever management fee I need to sort of keep the lights on. And the idea there is, and what you see a lot with hedge funds is, you know, you're incentivized to swing for the fences, swing for the fences, you're up, 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 collapse. You're back to where you started. LP has made zero money, but you have a yacht. Yeah. Right? And so that's, um, and, I, and, I, and as, a, as, a, as a GP, I would love to have long-term money, right? And so I think, you know, but that's, again, that's, that's sort of a tough thing to sell. You manage that portfolio through, I mean, it's been one of the more difficult times for value. I don't know if you've seen that Mikhail Samanov of Two Centuries has that chart that goes back to 1825 and it shows the current, I mean, this is price to book value, but I think that, you know, the narrative about price to book value has followed the more recent performance of it, which has been terrible. And it's now in sort of a, it's in one of these, it's in possibly the worst drawdown ever because I haven't seen the updated data since I think his study goes to May this year, and I think that it did continue to underperform a little bit. But basically, it's 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 about sixty percent behind the the glamour stocks. You know, where traditionally over a rolling period it outperforms. The only other times when that's happened, there's one 1904. <laughs> that's that's sort of equivalent. It's worse than the Great Depression. And then prior to that, there's sort of, you have to go back to like 1841 to see this sort of level of underperformance. I don't think that anybody had the sophistication at either of those dates to, to sort of declare value dead, but that seems to be the narrative is almost pervasive now that value investing is just a ridiculous concept. Well, I think, so let, let's get in a little bit. And, and you know, this came into, a, we've tweeted a little bit about this and this, this was in a chain by um, uh, whatever, a, a super magatu. Yeah, um, and, and in sort of talking about his value debt, and I know you recently had a pod with, 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 with Cliff Asness, and he was talking about the fact that, you know, for seven years, um, you know, it was it justified. Was, it was justified. And so, you know, this brings into my, my sort of question, you know, what is value? And so you say, okay, well, well, it's, it's you know, okay, we're defining it by price to book screen. Um, and I guess, you know, you, you, to say something, if the stocks weren't getting cheaper, um, or if you know if the earnings were declining in line with the sort of multiple staying low, and then uh, the companies were underperforming, then I, I don't even know if you call that a trap. I think you call that wrong. Right. And so I think I think what's important is uh, okay. So let's dig into you know so what, what what's happening underneath the surface. And unfortunately, I don't have the tools to do it on on a on a sort of macro level. But if you just think about let's just pick a company, and let's book Apple because it's a, it's popular. B, everybody knows it. C, Buffett bought in 2016. And so, all right, Buffett buys it at six and a half times adjusted earnings in 2016. Right. Right. Uh, uh, cash adjusted earnings. I'm subtracting cash out. Uh, maybe they had a nominal amount of debt at the time. I didn't think they were really doing that yet. But 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 the, those are sort of the numbers, six or seven times. And so let's imagine you buy a stock and it's trading at, at seven times. And so, you know, you put seven bucks out, it's earning a dollar. Now, the way I think about value and the way I, I, the, my framework for investing is there's, there's two things. There's endogenous returns and exogenous returns. So endogenous returns is it's the type of thing you get maybe from a private business. So you spend a $7 on a stock, it's earning a dollar. How do you make money? Well, we make money two ways. One, if someone bids the seven up, right? They pay eight, they pay nine, they pay 10. That's exogenous. That's someone else doing something to give you returns. But the other way is you just sit there and collect a dollar a year if you got earnings right. And they don't pay the dividend, but that's not the point. The point is if a company is retaining a dollar of earnings, whether they pay it out, whether they buy back stock, whether they reinvest it with you know, a, a positive MPV, the point is that every year they earn a dollar, you know, you're essentially, it's coming back to you as the business owner. If you, you know, and so I would look at sort of value and say, okay, so you paid seven dollars for something earning one dollar, and you know now it's at six dollars and it's earning seventy-five cents. And so you're like, ah, oh, well, value stinks. This went from seven to six. It's like, okay, well, that's not necessarily what happened there. Or you know, did they earn the dollar? They're about to earn another dollar, and it's still at seven there. And I think this is what Asses is referring to is what's happening in the past few years. And so I still think that cash flows will set you free. If you properly identify cash flows and you pay, and so now let's look at what else is happening in the market. Let's talk a little bit more about those exogenous returns and, and also the big thing that we hear all the time now, which is TINA, right? And even Buffett does this, which our equity is cheap. Well, they're cheap in relation to bonds and it's okay. What's happening now when you pay 30 times for Apple? So they earn a buck, you pay 30. 
And back to our original sort of endogenous, okay, you know what? Maybe you're okay with, I'm earning a buck a year, I paid 30, it's a 3% yield, treasuries stink, there's nothing else out there. But it's almost Bond-esque, the, 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 um, the arrangement that you've set up. Right? You're going to take, and let's assume that you just don't care what the stock does over the next 30 years. You don't manage outside capital. You're not taking any P&L risk. In the same way with the Treasury, you know, you, you have this, um, it comes due in a decade, right? And so for the bond and for Apple, maybe you sit there and you say, look, I'm fine with this. I'm fine getting my 3%, and I think Apple's earnings will hold up. The problem is, and the reason it's a flawed, you know, sort of investing trope is because buying stocks when interest rates are low, and that being the logic, doesn't actually hold up historically. Right. That didn't work until about 30 years ago. So if you go back from 1900 to 1970, and Montier did work on this, and he's basically like the Fed model, which was as right. interest rates go down, buy stocks, it's just correlation is not causation. And what you have to be careful with, so whenever I look at a security or think about a security, you have to think, you know, and this, you know, so much of investing is about the crowd and convincing people of other things and getting them to believe, right? And I think that if you can, and so instead of it being investing and speculating as, as sort of acts, I actually think you can break it down at the security level. Is this stock cheap enough that I just, and again, outside of mark to market and having to manage other people's expectations, um, am I okay with this earnings stream accruing to me based on the price I pay I don't care what anybody else does, right? And this is actually what, when Ben Graham, you know, wrote security analysis and he talked about um, Wright Aerospace and it was a company trading at eight with $8 in cash, earning two, paying a dollar dividend. And the whole point, if you can find Wright Aerospace, find a net net, if you find, you know, decent management is like, again, the market doesn't have to figure it out. You just don't care because you're getting a buck paid out to you, you paid eight, and you'll just sit there all day. Now it's nice. So if you're going back to Apple, Buffett was right to buy it because he's already gotten $10 sort of in accrued. Um, this is if you uh, split adjust when it was at 90, sort of right. it's at like 16 now, he's already accrued $10 in earnings. Now what's happened? The market's figured it out and they've bid it up. But, and this is another thing, and this comes up sometimes, uh, you know, when I hear you talk to other managers, we, we sort of talk about cost to, cost or market, right? It's like, well, I initiated the position at 5%, now it's 10%. I, uh, who was it? Um, I'm blanking on the name. Uh, uh, Steinhardt. He used to say when his portfolio wasn't working, he just sold everything. <laughs> he blew it up. And again, think about how hard that is for an institution to do. Like, what if you wrote a letter and you're like, yeah, guys, we sold it all, wasn't working, we're gonna rebuild it. But the point is that if you say 5% cost or 10% to market, you could all, you know, equity sort of liquidity aside, taxes aside, we all rebuild our portfolio every morning. Every morning you walk in, you're, you're, you're allocating 10% to your 10% name. And if you bought it at five, but now you're allocating 10 and it's gotten more expensive, that doesn't, again, taxes aside, that doesn't make any sense. You're actively allocating capital. Just because you're pressing buy on the computer doesn't change the active allocation. And so I do think that's something that, that's flawed. But the point is that now Apple, now it's gotten that massive exogenous return and it's been bid up to 30 times. And so if you wanna say, you know, so you say to somebody, why are you buying stocks? Oh, well, well, interest rates are low. It's like, well, what's your view on interest rates? I'm not a bond guy or fixed income guy. I don't have a view. Oh, yeah, you have a view, you just expressed a view, right? Unless you're putting on essentially a pair trade, you're making a relative value bet. Um, and so, you know, the, again, I think that I can't predict the noise, right? None of us can. And it's, and we, and that's what we get. So, um, oh my God, people are paying, you know, and this is another thing we hear a lot of, which is essentially, um, you know, the market isn't working, right? It, it's, they're, they're ignoring my names. Well, look, do we, does anyone in our business want the markets to be efficient? <laughs> of course not. Absolutely right? not. It's, Right, they just, you have no job. And so then they're inefficient, everybody whines. So wait, you want them to be inefficient just for long enough for you to get a position on and then them to become somewhat efficient. That sounds right? fair, that's exactly what I want. Right, right, it sounds perfect. But so the idea right now, so we're saying, look, growth is too expensive, value is too cheap. Good, you're in the, mud, you're in the business of exploiting mispricings. I agree. Um, and so, you know, I, 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 and it, but it doesn't mean it's not frustrating. And again, it also it comes back to time horizon. And it comes back to that institutional mandate. That comes back to 
you know, monthly returns. That comes back to, you know, perceptions of volatility or perceptions of being what box are you in and, and, and the ability. I mean, and, and this was, a, you know, a good example from the big short where Burry's like, oh, my God, you know, instead of looking at opportunities down here in, in sort of, you know, micro cap value, maybe he's doing that again. There's this massive opportunity over here. And, you know, he gets dragged through the mud and fired. But I could argue that they were right to fire him because he didn't fill his mandate. And I think that's, you know, that's another thing about this job is that you 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 fill a box. You know, you are the, a deep value guy. If you become a growth guy, I mean, maybe people want to be that, but someone probably hired you because they're looking at this sort of, you know, where's my best deep value guy and where's my short guy. And so I think as a portfolio manager, it does help. And this is why I say, so going back to teaching, which I haven't really touched on very much, but I, I want my students to understand that, oh, if I have this great idea and the boss won't buy it, it's like, well, how are you looking through things through your boss's lens and who he or she answers to and what those LPs expect from the boss? And, you know, if they step out of their box and lose money, how that might look particularly bad. Oh, you bought puts on Tesla? Since when are we put buyers? I didn't think we ever did that before. Um, and so, you know, all of, there's a business behind this. And it's not just picking stocks. And, you know, uh, it's not just whatever sort of, you know, duration you want. Well, well, let's just talk. So you're a, you're an adjunct professor at Columbia teaching applied value investing. Let's, can we talk a little bit about? Uh, let's talk about the value valuation. How are you teaching valuation? What's the? How do you think about it? How, how do you structure evaluation? Um, you know what we do is we. Uh, Bruce Greenwald wrote a book years ago, um, and now uh, uh, Paul Sonkin and Paul Johnson wrote a new book that touches on valuation. And it's funny because. We don't go that deep into it. Um, we, we, we talk, we sort of break down a balance sheet, we break down an income statement, we sort of leave growth out there because that's your traditional way of doing value. But we've sort of, and I, I co-teach with, with, with co-professor Eric Almarez who, run, who runs a fund called Apis Capital. Um, the way we view teaching is, you know, you have 36 hours of someone's attention and, you know, 34 of those hours are sort of going to sleep out of their ear when they leave your class, right? And so what are a few things that are going to resonate? And what we try to prepare them for is to be an analyst, to understand, you know, some of the risks we're talking about, and to see the different ways of, of, of looking at the world. And it's funny, a student said in, like, class three this year, he was like, wow, there seems to be so much luck involved. And I was so happy <laughs> because... Um, and again, I don't attribute to anything that happened. Uh, you know, I don't. I don't blame luck for 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 my fund not working. But the point is, yeah, there's luck. You know, like you just talked to me, deep value, and you read all the books. And that if you launch, to, someone comes out of school and launches tomorrow, doing exactly what you're doing, and tomorrow's the day it turn, they're hailed as a genius. And you're sitting there saying, dude, I've been doing this for 15 <laughs> years, right? And I'm, you know. Uh, and and so they will get lucky essentially when the cycle turns, using no different methodology. And I think. Um, you know, if you look at what's worked over certain times, you look at some of the growth people today. And again, just, a, you know, someone that doesn't know too much, um, you know, someone that thought Tesla would have, you know, $30 of earnings and, and, and robo taxis right now. They were wrong, but it, it doesn't matter. Right. Um, that happens too. Right. And so um, I, I, I joked the other day that that you're going to have you're going to be right and wrong and you're going to have good luck and bad luck in your career. But don't be wrong and have bad luck at the same time. <laughs> right. And that's so, impossible. <laughs> no, and then then, then, you're, then you're pretty much done. But what I what I want, so okay, so the first class, what we do is we, we bring them in and we talk about, you know, uh, these sort of the tent poles to, to value. Um, we talk about margin of safety, uh, and I, I very much, and it's funny, we talk about uh, sort of value being broken. Um, you know, value is a mindset. You are a shareholder in a company. You are owning a fractional value of a company. And I think that's something that you know, that, that Grammarly talked about, and it hasn't been lost because all of us think about owning a business. And at no point, you know, technicals aside, you can even add that in, but the point is you are the owner of a business. You view those share, those that, that cash, if they earn it, as accruing to you. And I think um, always having that in the back of your mind. And so, you know, Buffett bought Snowflake, right? Or, yeah. or, or Berkshire bought Snowflake. And or you can look at a growth name, but going back to what I was talking about before, look, maybe they're maybe they think the cash flows. I don't think that they're playing a greater fool's game. I think that because I don't think that's what they do. And so, you know, and, and one of the reasons I, I said earlier is, you know, talking about you know, how do you define value? I mean, Bill Miller was a, a val deemed a value investor and, and is considered a value investor but in the late 90s. He was buying tech companies. Right. And so I think what's changed is if you're viewing that okay, well, I own a business and I want a margin of safety. It's just the margin of safety is sort of shifted. 
if you think about the uh, you know a probability tree and, and outcomes and if you actually think about that white tail and what a company could become and even if you discount it you're still doing a probability tree and it always has been and the opportunities like uh, uh, right aerospace might not exist but these investors who have been able to look at now you go to business quality and say oh wow if they're reinvesting at this rate then the multiple it's deceiving um, and I essentially I I'll own it I want those cash flows I know how they look. I know 25 looks bad, but I also have a good idea or some confidence in how it will look in five years. Uh, and so, you know, we, we try to expose them to all that. And we also show them, you know, look, so Buffett shuts down the partnership and he says, give your money to Bill Ruane and that's uh, Sequoia. So if you look at 71 to 75, Sequoia underperforms four to five years. Actually, I actually have the numbers here. This is, it, it's, it's really quite funny. Um, to, to sort of ask the students about this. Okay, starting 1970, starting July 15th, they, they were up 12, S&P up 20. Next year, up 13, market up 14. Next year, up three, market up 19. Year four, down 24, market down 15. So they're either underperforming or they're losing more than the market. You, you're value guys, you're not supposed to lose money. Now you're down 25. If, you, if that's your first four years, you're, you're in a lot of trouble. So then what I say to them is that after the first, I don't know if it's 10 or 13 years, essentially Sequoia, they were up 17 when the S&P was up 10. So they created seven after fees, 700 basis points of alpha annually. So I'm the investing gene and I come to you and I say, listen, I will give you a decade where, or again, I don't know if it was decade or, yeah, I think through, yeah, through 1984. So 1970 and 1984, 14 years. It's 14 years, but you have to play it as it lies. So you have to have these five years, but you get 700 basis points of alpha a year through 14 years. So do you want to take your own chances or do you want Sequoia's returns? And they're all sort of confused. They all say, well, you said I'd get fired after four and a half years. I said, you will. <laughs> so they're like, all right, fine. I would do my on my own. I said, you're all idiots. Like I just offered you 700 basis points of alpha a year. And you said no. And so, but that's the point. And so, and again, when I, I don't want to talk about me. You know, I was Sequoia making a lot of mistakes or was it just not working out for them? And so if you look at that and you and so now let's look at a career as 50 years. And so you say, oh, my God, I will inevitably hit some bad trough. Right. It's going statistically. It has to happen. And so uh, Gotham had put out a paper and it's not on their site anymore. But they essentially said if you looked at over a decade, the, the top uh, quartile of performers, uh, um, a vast majority of them spent, you know, three years in the bottom decile. Right. Again, you're going to look dumb, and you very well might look dumb for an extended period of time. And statistically, it's going to happen. And so, you need to build a process that keeps you in the game, and that keeps you with LPs. And I don't care if it's growth or if it's value. And so, then we sort of start to study what works a little bit, and then we go into a little. And this is really fun. We take. Um, we take a company uh, that they don't know about, and and we, we have the first day as an analyst, your, your boss gives you a top sheet, and you sort of do a quick analysis. It's not a lot of information, but you know it's, it's 10 times, 10% uh, free cash flow yield, and these are the assets. And then we say, you know, would you would you buy more, hold, or sell? And someone looks in, they say, I would sell. And say, wait, wait, wait. So this is your first day in work, and you've looked at a company for 10 minutes, and you're gonna tell your boss you would sell their 3% position. And then, I don't know if I would do that. And I said, ah, but should you do that? So right now, I've created, you know, sort of an agency problem, right? Where, right. you know, now if we sell it and it goes up and his friend likes it or her friend likes it, now I'm in, you know, oh God, and you're thinking about career risk. And right on day one, you have to think about career risk. Um, and then, you know, things, the company comes out with an announcement, they're delaying earnings. Um, that's supposed to call tomorrow. There's supposed to be a conference call tomorrow for earnings. And at 3.52 in the afternoon, this is, this really happened, by the way, they announced we're delaying earnings and they don't hold the stock. Your boss yells, what's going on? What are we doing? Why is this moving? The hell do you know, right? You don't know anything. All they, so is that bullish or bearish? And what I try to shake them out of, look, I, I think we all like to think that, you know, Buffett, we read, he just sits, you know, sits around and he reads all day. And, you know, you don't have the screens on. And, and, and sure, I think that's, that's the utopia. But the reality is you're going to work for someone and, and stocks are going to move. And it's going to sometimes happen at 352. And you can't shut your phone down. Um, that's the reality. And so anyways, all the succession of events happen and, and, you know, they'll buy stock at 15 and they won't add at 12. And I say, OK, well, how did your how did your intrinsic value change? Like, well, it didn't really change. But why the heck aren't you buying more stock? Right. And then 
you know, anyways, it's fun because it's a very live situation and uh, they get skin in the game. Um, so we try to do things like that, which again are very, that's why I call it applied value investing, right? It's not just theoretical. It's really, you know, you, you, you have to, and anyways, they end up sort of buying it as it goes down and then they have way too big positions. <laughs> um, you could actually, it's there's evil. literally no money. There's no money change trading place, obviously, but like they're, they're frustrated and some guy, you know, you have a, a, a sort of a, a whale, like just, you know, with a 30% position, it's all quite <laughs> So, are you if it's if it's that if it's the Greenwald uh, class, are you teaching to the Greenwald from Buffett and we, Graham we, to so be on? Yeah, we we touch on it, but even Greenwald has said, you know, we didn't really get growth right, and we're working on that. Um, and I kind know, of I, like that Greenwald's got that methodology where he says you look at the steady state and you look at the flows from that, which might be the dividends and any buyback yield, and then you've got the growth portion, which is basically you know what your what you're reinvesting by your return on invested capital over whatever your discount rate is. And so you get some idea. You're explicitly breaking it into two parts. One is the steady state where you're getting the dividend or the buyback. And then you're thinking separately about how it's growing. And that, and that looks at what you're reinvesting, what the, like the likely return internally to the company, and then sort of how much cash flow, where that's being priced in the market. That, that's Greenwald's franchise value as far as I can record and the nice thing is it breaks into two and so you can you can have that thought and it, it also doesn't rely on any movement in the multiple for you to sort of figure out where your return is going to come from yeah and i mean he talks also about you know you, you sort of break down the balance sheet and you, you break down earnings power value and then you look to right. see if they if, if they're over over earning or under earning and i think that's sort of value valuable if, if you want to be um an activist. I mean, look, I think that so much of what's happened is that sort of breaking down the balance sheet. Look, it's very important to understand a balance sheet, but buying it something at a discount to sort of liquidation value is is um, not available too much these days. Right. Um, and so, you know, I think, again, we, we, we like to touch on it, but we, we segue a little bit from it because we do, you know, we want them to think you know, sort of once you do the balance sheet work, I don't think too much of the further work is going to be, oh, you know, again, I'm buying it at a discount to its balance sheet. Although understanding how the earnings are working in relation to, you know, return on assets and whether or not this is a good business, those those sorts of things do matter. So, and, and going back to, you know, you said sort of, what are you teaching? We don't, we try not to, it's not a heavily, it's not a heavy security analysis class because what I'm trying to do is is expose them to things and again, you know, they are going to, it's like the question they ask, you know, what's the right sizing? What's your behavior? You know, what's the behavior of that of your LPs? Anyone will tell you that to out, the, the, your best chance of outperformance is concentration. It's probably your best chance of blowing up. Right. I mean, look, if you own 500 you get stocks, both tiles. and you're not going to look different than the index, right? And so, okay, well, where do I want to fit in? You know, what's my, um, and there's great funds that are able to own a handful of stocks, um, and so, but there isn't a right answer, right? Um, and, and look, if you own a couple stocks, like don't blow it, right? The hurdle, you know, and so and this also goes back to, um, you know, you, you sort of thinking about batting average and, and, and slugging percentage. And even a Soros, I think would say that he was actually wrong more than he was right, but his sizing and the, and the magnitude, this is like the old, you know, the, the, the old adage is like, well, 90% of options expire out of the money. It's like, right, but if the other 10% are up 11 fold, then I guess you should buy options. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and so, you know, whether it goes back to sizing or whether it goes back to, to, to the framework, you know, I'm not, we don't send them out and say, go look for net nets. And if you can find things that have traded a discount to the balance sheet, um, buy them because, I think that's true, but I think that they're going to be uh, looking for other things to do pretty quickly. Um, and so, hold on, let me just see. Uh, the, the Greenwald, I've heard that before that Greenwald felt that he didn't get growth right in uh, in the Graham to Buffett and Beyond book. And I thought that the more recent, he, there's, there are a few papers floating around where he talks about this this uh, this other method that, that he uses that I think is quite effective because it doesn't require any mo you don't need to assume it's different from a DCF where you're you have the gigantic terminal value that's sort of basically opaque so you have no view into you know is this thing going to grow faster than GDP for perpetuity like, I have no idea at all you know that's right. I think that's an impossible decision to make but the the growth portion where you can say look this thing uh, currently you know it is earning more than the average company in the in the S&P 500 
um, you can see how much it's reinvesting. So you've got some idea that there are flows going back into this thing. It seems to have a reinvestment runway. And we've got an idea about the cash flows that are in, in, in totality that are going in. So we can come up with sort of a rough estimate. And then it, the number that it spits out is basically sort of an expected return. And so you're not really coming up with a hard uh, intrinsic value. Rather, you're sort of coming at, at it more like a Mobison approach where, you know, look, this thing, it, the expected return is very, very high here. So maybe we should be allocating a little bit more capital to this thing. Yeah, and I think that, I, you know, in in the framework, and again, it's again, it's funny sort of watching, um, and Bruce, I, I, he, I think he retired and he's, but, you know, he's still doing some work and I think he's working on another volume. I think, you know, what's happening. So if you, if you go and read that book and sort of, again, they, they, they don't, dig too much into growth, right? And and historically value, I mean, they, that, that wasn't part of the work, right? Because it's the whole sort of the, the, the upside is free. And, and I right. think while he did it, while Buffett did it stealthily, right? He started buying quality, but it, it, it didn't really become, um, I don't know when sort of that, that mantra sort of started to take over. Uh, but I think what, what you find is that, I mean, look, you know, value used to be contrarian. Right. Um, and, you know, how many people sort of go to Omaha every year? Right. And so yeah. you talk about high screen, low price to book. Should it work? Well, or does it work? Like, well, should it work? I mean, how many people are screening low, low, low price to book? Um, or does it not work simply because something doesn't work for five years and then that just works? Right. It's, it's, it's literally, you know, everyone, you even get the value guys that decide that this doesn't work because um, I don't have long enough capital. And so we all sort of move to where, where, where the ball is as opposed right. to where it's going. Um, and, you know, st starting to ask this question more about quality of business and growth, um, uh, it's, it's something that I think, you know, they're starting to probe a little bit more. And again, when I talked to Greenwald about it, he said, you know, we're working on sort of a, a better framework for growth. I just wondered if that was the one that he'd been talking about because I, I had seen that and I, I think it's, it's intuitive. It's good for, uh, and, and the, the thing that I like about it is it doesn't require you to look out a decade and try and figure out where it is in a decade you sort of look at where it is today what like what you can all of the inputs are historical and then you just yeah, sort of I mean, seeing what kind of magnitude of expected return are we talking about here yeah no that that, that sounds right um do you want to talk a, do you want to talk a name do you want to have a quick shot at tesla <laughs> uh, um here here's here's what i'll say about about tesla and i think you know i, I we joked about you know it turning a lot of people away, um, and I think it would take sort of a whole pod or, or a series of pods to talk about it. But what what you what you realize about Tesla is how much um, how much narrative matters, right. how much storytelling matters, and so one other thing about class, one of the things we talk we touch on are frauds, and what I really want them to learn about frauds is that auditors don't do anything, and the SEC doesn't do anything. They do things after the fact. Um, but, you know, if you look at yesterday, the LA Times or one of the, one of the papers sort of showed a, a guy in a Model X sitting in the passenger seat and the car is driving itself. Now, does that guy think he's being an idiot? Probably not, right? Or he thinks that, that look, if this thing couldn't do what I'm having it do, someone would do something, right? The NHT, NHTSA or, or, you know, Tesla wouldn't do that. People don't sell dangerous products. Um, and so whether, you know, I, I like to say that at Tesla, people are like, what kind of company is it? Is it, is it, a, is it a car company? Is it, a, is it an energy company? Um, the product at Tesla is the stock. Right. Okay. They, they sell stock. And they do whatever they can. And Elon does whatever he can to keep the stock price up. And if you look at the way that his incentives work and the way his margin structured, it's all based on the stock. And you have to be careful of narratives. You know, there's this good movie about you know sort of Facebook and how it's how it's uh, what is it called it's, um, the social just, network. The social network was uh, right. It is the social network. Yes, thank you. Um, but what you realize is that this is happening for for investing too. And so if you were to poll people and you're in California and you say you know is Tesla profitable? Um, you know did they ever ask? Uh, did OSHA ever show up with a warrant to come into their factory and get turned away? You know, are the products dangerous? Anything like that? Of course, they, they have a good view because that's what's in the news um, and that's what's on Facebook. And so, uh, I think the the point is that if you if you look at Tesla, you think about trading Tesla, 
um, what you have to see is a bit of a narrative shift, right? And as long as these things are out there, um, look, this is the only man on earth who can lower the price for his product and have people believe that they're supply constrained. <laughs> why would you lower the price on a plate? Why would you lower the price on a product when you make no money if you're supply constrained? And he's not supply constrained, but his narratives are working. And I think that's a, it's a, it's a very, you know, is, again, going back to things like sizing, going back, you know, shorts, willing to leave money on the table. And I think that's a very hard thing. And I think, look, in 30 years, you know, your kids will be like, I can't believe you were in a market so messed up now. And I can't believe when you were around, you got to short things like Tesla at $400 billion and they didn't have any earnings. And you'll say, look, you know, it, it, it wasn't that easy. Um, and so, you know, it, look, it's, it, it's fascinating. It's fascinating to watch the media around it. Um, and I think you have to think about how, you know, you, you talk a lot about Nikola, right? And the things that, that Nikola is um, sort of accused of doing with their reveal. Uh, and you say, well, why is the media treating them differently? But if they are treating them differently, sort of what, what's, what's the fundamental value there? What is Nikola? What's underneath? Um, and maybe seeing a narrative shift, right? right. Um, and waiting for that narrative shift, which is very hard to do. It's very hard to wait for that narrative shift. And I think you have to do it, especially on the short side, as far as being careful, um, you know, trading carefully, limiting your risk. Those things are, you know, inc infinitely more important. I mean, they're important on the long side, but even more so on the short side. Yeah, it's fascinating. Uh, David, that's all we have time for. So if folks want to follow along with what you're doing or get in contact with you, how, how do they go about doing that? Well, Toby, you and I met on Twitter. And so my Twitter handle is uh, it's uh, at David Mark Horn. So D-A-B-I-D-M-A-R-C-H-O-R-N. And I was saying that my, my handle is actually the hard 17. Um, what was it, the hard 17? So Paul De Podesta, and I think maybe in Moneyball or one of, one of uh, Michael Lewis's books, uh, talks about being at a blackjack table. And, you know, someone hits a hard 17, they pull a four, and everyone cheers. And, oh, my God, that's a great hit. And he's thinking, it's not a great hit. It's a horrible hit. What are you doing? But so we sort of have this obsession with outcome and not process. Right. Yeah, I love that. Well, to that. well, I appreciate the time. Thanks very much, David. Thanks, Toby. Take care.